I'm, I'm really happy to talk about this topic. It's sort of leading from what Matsu was just talking about um, in terms of international impacts assessments. So what I want to talk a little bit today is some impact assessment that we have been working on specifically for rain shifting plants in the Northeast. So that gets a little bit at that question of like, how do you combine establishment with impact? Um, and so our, our talent, right, is that we've got these two global change phenomena going on. We have warming climate, um, and therefore these kind of species are moving around, new ecosystems. Jeff showed earlier a figure kind of like this one. Um, here's the Massachusetts equivalent of what you saw for Indiana earlier, right? We're here now, we're already in a, a warmer climate than the end of the last century, and we're headed uh, south, we're headed uh, uh, hotter and hotter um, as time goes by. Um, and so how are species responding to that? Well, species are responding generally by shifting their ranges. Um, and invasive species especially um, are shifting their ranges. And so this is just an example of one particular species. So this is an aquatic species, water primrose, Ludwigia grandiflora. Um, this map on the left is from some work led by Jenica Allen. Um, and so what you see on here is all of the dots are areas where we have current distributions or invasions of this particular aquatic species. And then based on some models relating the distribution of, those, uh, of that species to climate, we can model the potential range. So everything that you see in red here is areas where that species could currently establish, um, including uh, much of southern New England. And then if we forecast into the future, out to 2050 in this case, uh, all of these orange colors on here, which now encompass pretty much all of the Northeast, um, are areas where this species is then projected to be able to establish into the future. Um, so that's an example of one species. And the problem is that if we start looking at, well, what are invasive plants of, of North America, um, the invasive plant atlas of the United States has over 1,200 species. If we start adding to that noxious weed list from various different states and federal, we can get up to something like 2,000 species of plants that are likely invasive plants that are likely to be moving around, shifting their ranges uh, associated with climate change. Um, and we saw this figure before. Uh, again, why is this a particular issue for the Northeast? Because the Northeast, we are a hot spot of, you know, these sort of red in here. Lots of plants are headed towards the Northeast. Um, in this case, in, in some parts of the Northeast, over 100 species. And so how do we take this knowledge that we've got a lot of species moving and try to pare it down a little bit? because we can't treat all of those hundreds of species that are potentially coming into the Northeast. Um, that, you know, that, you know, if, I, if I gave you a list of that thousand species and said, here, go out and deal with those species, right? That's just totally impractical. It's not the kind of thing that we can do. Um, and so ideally what we want to be able to do is to find the species like this red one that would, if they got to New England, rapidly increase their populations, have large uh, high abundance, high impact, high control costs, that's our big win, right? If we can eradicate those, if we can put that high up on the watch list and stop those ones from establishing and spreading, we get a really big bang for the buck. As opposed to this kind of blue species, which, you know, if it arrived in, in the Northeast, it's, it's also likely to come up here, but ultimately it doesn't attain super high abundance. It's not a particularly impactful species. And so if we spend all of our time working on the other thousand species that might get here, then we've wasted a lot of time and resources. Um, and so what we're doing is sort of a two-step process. So the first piece of this is to use these range shift projections um, to generate a series of watch lists. So here's another just example species where we've got, in this case, for, for this particular species, the current range does not include uh, the Northeast, but the future range in this kind of orange color does start to get into southern New York and, and southern New England. And so that might be a species that we might not be worried about today, but would make it onto the watch list because it could potentially get here in the future. And just as an aside, this work of generating watch lists for any different state jurisdiction um, is ongoing work that, uh, that Dr. Jenica Allen is working on through um, some funding through the, from the Northeast IPM Center. 
They are, um, she's working with the, the EdMaps developers down in Georgia to um, put together a, a, a website to, to basically get this onto the EdMaps website such that you could put in, um, you know, your state, how far away you're, uh, you know, if, you, if you're worried about a propagule in the next state versus, you know, one that's coming from Florida kind of thing, your uh, confidence and how far away. Um, how many models, so you know, lots of different climate models and, uh, and geographic models go into this, so how confident you want them to be. So this is going to be a way to develop uh, you know, and present some of those lists based on the, the modeling work that, um, that we've already put together. So luckily I have an in uh, into Jenica's work. So she generated this watch list for us um, last year, and this is a watch list of all the different plant species um, coming into New York and New England that are not currently established in, in this geographic region. So the ones on top are all of the ones not currently here, but could potentially establish um, uh, currently and are likely to expand their ranges moving out to 2050. The ones on the bottom here are ones that could not, based on climate, currently establish, but are likely to become newly established or could have the potential to newly establish by 2050. Um, so this is a list, I'm sure you guys have already counted, of 93 different species, uh, which is a fairly extensive list, right? Again, if I give you a list of 93 species, that's way too many to try to deal with, especially because these things aren't even here yet, so we don't even have the, you know, we don't necessarily have the protocols for identifying them or, or figuring out where they're likely to be. And so what we're doing with that list of 93 species is we're applying the ICAT assessment, so the ICAT assessment that Monty just talked about in the, in the previous talk, um, and that ICAT is the Environmental Impact Classification for Alien Taxa, so that's so what, as I keep saying ICAT, it's just this acronym for, the, for an impact assessment protocol. Um, and what this protocol involves is it involves uh, doing a, a literature review. So you need to have access uh, to uh, Web of Science um, and, or Google Scholar could also potentially work the same way. And, uh, and with that, you read through titles and abstracts. So you would search for the specific species name that you're interested in and read through titles and abstracts of those to identify any papers that uh, are measuring impact of that species. Um, and I, I have May up here, so May Rockwell Postel is an, an undergraduate at the University of Massachusetts who has been working on, so all the results that I'm presenting are kudos to her, she's over here. Um, and I, so, in a, so May is, is an exceptional undergraduate, but I do want to point out that she is an undergraduate, and so this is the type of work that does not require advanced degrees that can be, uh, you know, applied, as Matsi said, um, as, as a general framework that's fairly straightforward to um, Monte put some of these up before, but I just wanted to go through them again. So there are a range of, for any paper that you would read about the impacts of a particular plant or taxonomic group that you are interested in, um, you have a score of ecological impact. And the score of ecological impact goes from one, minimal, uh, it actually goes to five, which is massive, but five includes the uh, extirpation or extinction of a species, and we don't see that with plants. So we've kind of excluded five in this case. So in this case, for ecological impacts, we're going on a scale of minimal. So minimal and minor are basically ones where, you know, the uh, a native species might respond. It might have slightly lower fitness or something like that. It might not be growing as well, but the overall population of the native species is not changing. So that's a, a minor or a minimal impact. When we get into moderate to major concerns, those are ones where either uh, the uh, a native species is having a major, uh, sorry, a mo moderate is the native species. So if a single native species is having a decline in a population associated with uh, an invasive species, that ranks as moderate. If you have a community level effect, that is multiple native species are responding negatively to uh, an invader, that gets you into this major concern. And then we've actually added a couple of chunks on here because we heard um, from, from folks in the Northeast that, um, that we want to be able to also annotate uh, places where we have an agricultural. So agricultural in this case, we're dealing with a, a crop yield um, impact. 
any kind of economic impact separate from crop yields, and then human health impacts, so those might include things like allergies. And so here's an example from that, uh, that water primrose, the one that I showed you in one of those earlier examples that is not yet here, could establish here. Um, and Monty went through some of the impact mechanisms. These are the ones that are relevant to, to invasive plants. But just to make the point that there are a variety of impact mechanisms for which we produce some sort of, in this case, a maximum impact score. So if there are five papers that report something about competitive impacts of an invasive plant on the native species or community, if two of those papers talk about the impacts on a single species and three of them talk about negative impacts on a community, then the maximum score is going to be a four, a major impact, because they're having negative impacts on the overall community. There were several, and there are always going to be for each species, several where you get an NA just because we have not reported any hybridization impacts of this water primrose, for example. Um, and then for the agricultural, economic, and human health, we're just noting them as either present or absent because we don't have an equivalent kind of one to four scoring. And then the other piece that we were showing here is the number of papers that were assessed. So there were 11 papers dealing with the impacts of water primrose on um, ecosystems, economies, or human health. Um, and so that's where these total scores come from. So remembering that like one is low and four is high, if we look at this, this looks like a pretty badass species, right? We've got a lot of fours on here. We've got a couple of unknowns, but basically fours, threes, and then uh, impacts on agricultural, economic, and human health. Uh, considerations. But if we cross that with, you know, a variety of different species, we can, you know, we can really start to pick out ones where there are, you know, pretty major overall impacts, like that water primrose, which is over here, or uh, like a vena barbata, um, or ones that, that have a much lower impact. So again, you know, there's a fair number of papers looking at um, Japanese privet impacts, but actually when you look at the impacts of Japanese privet, uh, we got you know, only a, a max of a three, so an impact on a single species, but not a community, um, in this case, associated with disease transmission. Um, and so here, this is a plot of just of, of the species that May has assessed so far, which is about fit in the 50s at this point. Um, so we have, we're getting to 93, and we're actually pretty close to there. Um, this is just a, a plot of where we see minimal, minor, moderate, and major for each of the different uh, impact mechanisms. Um, so you can see that competition, not surprisingly for invasive plants, competition meant the most of the studies are, are showing a competitive impact of invasive plants on uh, native species or native communities. Much of the, these major impacts we're seeing from competition too. But we're also seeing a variety of other uh, ecological impacts in here. So facilitating other invasive species, having some sort of poisoning or toxic impact. We're seeing a fair number of agricultural impacts. We've just noted these all as major just for sort of convenience sake. Um, and so we've taken this and we've put all of this together. And this is just a draft, so I have draft at the end of this. But of the uh, 93 species where we started out with, these are all the range shifting ones, we've tried to bend this into high, medium, low priority. We've got some that we're still working on, so not yet analyzed. Um, and then there are a number of species in kind of gray on here that are distant, meaning that there were not enough papers to really be able to say we know what the impact is. So those are kind of our unknown species. Um, for this first, first draft of, of impacts, we have uh, identified high priority as ones that had at least two in the major category. So regardless of mechanism, there were at least two categories that, that showed up as major. Um, you're in medium if you've got one major, and then low if you don't have any. So, so actually, this has worked out, I think, fairly, fairly well in terms of identifying a few species that really show up as highlighted as high concern, and then a fair number of species that. Um, and I'm hoping that in the, in the discussion section, which we're going to have um, after the next talk, that we can talk a little bit more about this impact mechanism piece, because we're struggling a little bit with, well, if you get a four in competition, does that equal a four? in uh, you know, changing 
in the chemistry of the soil versus you know the fire regime or something like that are all impact mechanisms equal in terms of our management goals um, and then or or do we only care that it's a major impact on the the native community and so just to conclude this so we know that invasive plant ranges are shifting with climate change um, What's kind of cool is that we know the pool of these range shifting species are already here in the US. And so actually, I think this is one of those, the few potential wins that we have with this intersection of climate change and invasion, which is that we have this kind of unique opportunity to prioritize our management towards species that haven't yet gotten here, that we can get them at those early stages when we know that management is most effective. Um, and ideally eradicate before they become problematic these really high-risk species. So thanks very much.